Hello, everyone. Hi. This is what we're here to talk about today, a filmmaker's guide to decoding social divisions. A few years ago, there was a film, this grand magnum, magnum opus, that when it released, became India's highest grossing film worldwide and won the best film award at the National Awards. I was particularly excited about this film, like I'm sure a lot of you must have been. Bahubali, the beginning, had these amazing VFX effects. It was this grand period drama. And it had something that Indian films have traditionally lacked, which is a number of strong, fearless, badass female characters. Like Avantika, for example, who is one of the leading characters. She's the skilled warrior that Bahubali falls in love with. He spends days looking at her in the woods and you know, painting flowers on her skin when she's asleep. When they finally come face to face, Avantika is angry with him and she wants to fight with him. And he happily obliges. And with amazing ease, while he's fighting, he undoes the braids in her hair, he washes her dirty face, he puts kajal in her eyes, he puts a bindi on her face. And with, in, with this incredible skill, he strips off his, her warrior robes and converts her dhoti into a ghagra. And when she looks at herself in the reflection in the waterfall, She's amazed. She's like, wow, I look so beautiful. And she's so overwhelmed by this that she has tears in her eyes. She hugs Bahubali and she falls in love with him. Such an overwhelming scene of two warriors falling in love through serious sexual assault. I mean, a group of individuals, writers and filmmakers, sat in a room and thought about what the best possible way was for these two characters to fall in love. And this is what they finally decided to go with. The thing is, in film, every action is a decision. And every decision in this particular scene drew home a thought. The thought that if you tame a strong woman by force, she's going to be so thankful to you that she's going to fall in love with you. OK, calm down. It's just a film, right? It's just a film. It's fiction. It's not real. And it's actually very comforting to know that this isn't real. Because if we start talking about what the same mindset would do in real life, this conversation we're having today would be much, much more uncomfortable. And honestly, that's not the conversation I'm here to have with you today. I'm here to talk to you about how this opinion you're forming in your head right now, about whether you strongly agree with me or strongly disagree with me, about whether you like me or not, or whether you want to continue paying attention to what I'm going to say based on what I've said so far, or how I look, or how I sound, is not your opinion at all. You know, we believe we make up our own minds, but we're such fools for believing that because you and I, we're all so brainwashed in ways we don't even understand. I write films. And the first thing you need when, when you write a film is you need to write a story. And one of the first things you need to do to write a story is a protagonist. Now, what is a protagonist? A protagonist is the person from whose perspective we're understanding the story, a hero, a heroine. This is the person we feel for. This is the person we're rooting for, we identify with. The next thing we need is an antagonist, which is the opposite, a villain, someone we have to fight against, something we have to overcome. This is the person we villainize. And for all to be well in the world again, this evil must be demolished. I started writing films when I was about your age. And I wrote so many of them, I got kind of obsessed with the process. And very inconveniently for everyone around me, I started looking at life like it was a film, like it was a script. Every person became a character. And every action just had to have a motivation behind it, just waiting to be decoded. And when I looked around me, I realized suddenly, everyone was divided into protagonists and antagonists, good guys and bad guys, heroes and villains, us and them. But not by me. These divisions already existed, and our societies were thriving on them. But why was this divisiveness so successful? Let's look at it from the perspective of psychology. Now, when people are divided into groups, it's logical to assume that group biases occur because of personal factors, right? But in the 70s, when a bunch of social experiments were conducted by psychologist Henry Tajfel and his colleagues, they found something a little different. They developed what is called the social identity theory, which explained that the minimum condition required for display of group biases, like prejudice against members of another group or favoritism towards members of your own group, was simply being a member of a group. 
So, for example, if I divided all of you into two groups, arbitrarily, completely randomly, and you knew nothing personally about either members of your own group or members of the other group, you are still likely to show favoritism towards members of your own group and prejudice against members of the other group. Now let's look at the same phenomenon, the us versus them phenomenon, from the perspective of evolutionary biology. Award-winning filmmaker and systems researcher Anand Gandhi echoes the conclusions of several neuroscientists and evolutionary biologists when he says that we are hard-coded to have notions of kin and other. Because in forest and savanna environments, which is where we emerged as a species, it had survival value to understand who we shared our genes with and who are the others who are going to compete with us for those resources and try to steal them away from us. But today we don't need that, right? Because all of us have evolved from the same, same people in one way or another. And in that sense, we're all extended kin. So what do people do? They manufacture identity-based divides so that they can emerge as kin leaders. So you, and that's why you see politicians, for example, uh, creating fracture lines on the basis of color, shared history, shared geography, shared resources, all for their own benefit. And it makes us think, right? So are we divided because of reasons that exist? Or are we creating reasons because we are divided? Think about that. Think about casteism, racism, sexism. Could it be that like on the pages of my scripts, and on the fiction, in, in the fictional world of my films, there is someone very strategically planning who should be the protagonist, who should be the antagonist, and what should be the conflict in our real lives. Perhaps. That's getting heavy now. Let's go back to talking about films, right? Science fiction. Who likes science fiction here? I personally love science fiction, uh, especially alien films, right? Alien invasion films of these crazy aliens just invading our worlds and destroying everybody. Somehow they always end up in the United States for some inexplicable reason, right? Um, isn't it strange that when you think about an alien, you imagine this big, scary monster that's just going to destroy you and everybody you love and everything you know. What's strange about that is that human beings have actually never met any aliens in our entire history. In fact, we're actually seeking, actively seeking contact and communication with aliens. We're hoping that we'd be able to communicate with them. Isn't it also strange that the term alien is a legal term in America used to describe individuals who don't belong to that country, who belong to another country? If you think about it, aliens is the ultimate other. It's the easiest way to teach us that anyone unknown is going to come and try to destroy us. Which brings us to the question of propaganda, right? How and why should we recognize propaganda? Why is it so important? And how do we actually do that? Now, I'm not saying that alien invasion films shouldn't be made. They're really cool, and I really enjoy them. They should definitely be made. I'm also not saying that passionate storytelling should be abandoned, and everything should only be shown in a cold, clinical, observational manner. What I'm saying is, that we must be able to recognize the difference between passionate storytelling and emotional manipulation. We should be aware of what it is that we are being made to think. And the way to do that is by simple questions and fact-checking. Questions like, for example, why for several decades in Bollywood cinema have bad guys been depicted as dark-skinned? Or why consistently over decades in Indian television, women wearing Western clothes have been depicted as homebreakers? Wouldn't it be awesome if there was a little simple checklist that helped us recognize these propaganda techniques? There actually are. There are loads of these. If you do a simple search online, you'll find lots of articles that educational organizations have developed, distilled and simplified for us to be able to understand what are the specific techniques used by propaganda. Of course, these techniques will keep evolving as our societies evolve. But if you and I understand the basics of divisive politics, we can hope to stay ahead of these manipulations. Remember, it's always our emotions they go after. They rouse us, they make us feel so strongly that we are compelled to form an opinion and compelled to take action. Now, last year, around December, I had to write a new feature film script. So I did what I had to do, which is write a basic story, come up with my protagonist. 
And when I shared those ideas with a few close friends, the first question I was asked was, why is the protagonist a man? And I was like, yeah, fair question. Why is he a man? Because there was nothing in the story that required him to be a man. The only reason was that I had grown up watching so many films, but the protagonist was always male. So the protagonist in my film was also male. So strong was the conditioning that it affected not just whose stories I was consuming, but also whose stories I was now choosing to tell. We look at films, we look at media, we look at social media as validation of social behavior to understand what is okay to do and what is not okay to do, right? Which is why it's so important to look at the representation in these media as well. In 2018, earlier this year, a statistical study was conducted by IBM Research India along with individuals from four different Delhi-based organizations, educational organizations. And what they did was they basically helped us quantify in numbers the gender bias that exists in the Hindi film industry. So they chose 4,000 films released from, uh, since 1970. These were all Hindi films. And they analyzed various things in it. And among the things that they looked at were occupation, description, and emotions displayed by male and female characters. Here's what they found. They found that consistently over the years, male characters were described through occupation, you know, an honest police officer, or a successful scientist, things like that, a successful businessman. And female characters were described with their appearance, beautiful or simple looking. Also, the female characters were never, were never introduced independently. They were always introduced with respect to a male character, like daughter of or sister of. But the male characters were always shown as independently successful. The other thing they did was, they looked at a bunch of movie trailers over the last 10 years, and they saw what are the emotions that are being displayed by male and female characters in these movie, th movie trailers. And they saw that over the last 10 years, the biggest disparity was in the emotion of anger. So 23.6% of all emotions displayed by male characters in movie trailers was anger, but the same number in female characters was only 14.5%. And women were consistently also depicted as happy compared to male characters in movie trailers. Now let's expand the same spirit of analysis to real life. How are women being spoken about, for example? What are the adjectives and verbs being used when you describe women in everyday conversations or in news articles, for example? What are the emotions they are being appreciated for? And what are the emotions they are being mocked for? Now let's expand the same thing to other group divisions. When, when two different groups that are in conflict are being spoken of, how is one group being des described? Is one of the two groups being villainized or caricaturized? What is the proof behind the way those groups are being described? What would the story sound like if it was, if it was being said from the perspective of the other group? A lot of the times, you'll find that the reasons of conflict are attributed to history, to the past. But the truth also is that history is not immune to the same kind of manipulation we're talking about right now. History is not immune to subjectivity, which brings us to a very, very important question, which is, who gets to decide representation? It is the person telling the story, which is why we must constantly, relentlessly seek who are telling the stories that we are hearing, seeing, and believing. Conflicts, both real and imagined, are meant to make us feel threatened, right? It is our instinct to protect our own against others. That's how we function as social animals. The question is, is our definition of social family restricted to our biological kin, our race, our gender, our nationality, our community? Or can it be expanded to include human beings, all human beings, and maybe all living beings, and maybe all living beings as well? The good news is that definition of us can be determined by us. Thank you.